is that working? Yeah. Um, so what I'm saying is that if you can get the fueling bit right, you can avoid injury and you can avoid sickness. Would people believe that or do you think I'm making that up? Yeah. So, and I know it's tricky. It's a, it is a, a bit of a balancing act and, and I can understand the reasons why. And I do get the reasons why people um, can't or won't or struggle probably is a better word. Um, but we have to try and come up with solutions to that. Um, so solutions, you have to think about it. You can't, we cannot continue not to see food as a positive thing. And we have, as a group, as a sporting group, I want you to go away today with saying, we cannot continue to starve ourselves because that's effectively what you are doing. That's how serious um, the issue is in terms of, I am just so sad at the amount of injuries that I see that are completely preventable because people just didn't understand how much food they actually need to consume. And that becomes the limiting factor because people actually think they are eating enough because compared to the other people, as Matt have just said, you are a different group. You are different from not only other athletes, but the general population, your family. So when you sit down to what looks to be a big plate of food compared to your peers or your family, it's nowhere near the mark. Does anybody know what 6,000 calories looks like? It's not. Big steak dinner won't even cut the mustard. That's the problem. Because people are eating the wrong types of food. So to get 6,000 calories in, we've actually got to eat a lot of food. So then when we take in influencers like, it has to be clean, it can't be this, it can't be that. Do you know how many plates of rocket you might have to eat to get 6,000 calories? A lot, yeah. Chickpeas, how many of those would you have to eat? Hundreds of thousands. But that's what I mean, we've got to really re-look at how we look at food. And again, one of the things I want us to come out of here with today is there is no such thing as a good or a bad food. It is in context. Health is context. A stress fracture, is that healthy? No, okay? General public, if they're eating some of the things, they won't get stress fractures. You guys will get stress fractures. You guys might get elevated cholesterol because you're actually not eating enough. Whereas the general public will get it because they're eating too much. They're not doing. So we'll discuss why that might be as well in a minute. Um, so hopefully you're not sleeping at the end of this. Um, this is from the World Cross Country Schools last year where they had a nutrition talk and they were all asleep, I think, during it. So we'll try and not have you asleep during the session. Um, uh, so for me, um, short term, I think people look at this all the time. You've got to look at this. Right, so some of the stuff that you'll be doing now at your age group is going into your longer term health. You've got to think about your bone health. You've got to think about developing a resilience in yourself as a, a person, a strength. And for what I see again, some of the athletes that we're seeing have absolutely hammered themselves at 15, 16, 17, 18. And then they're bearing the brunt of it then when they get to 23, 22, 25. Do you see what I mean? So we got to not only what you're eating and drinking is developing for your short-term performance benefits, we're looking at the longer-term um, picture there as well. And that's important, coaches, because you've got to um, reinforce and force that as well. So what we want, we want strong immunity, reduced risk of injury and fatigue. Is that good? Yeah, yeah. yeah you want that, don't you? Okay. Um, we can fuel to train, perform, delay fatigue, enhance recovery. Is that positive? Yeah. yeah? And we want to make sure that you, you can heal or recover from injuries if you get that. Nutrition can do all of those. Food can actually do all of those. Even a Mars bar, would you believe? Put in the right place. And I don't want you to come out of here saying she told me that I could eat Mars bars. So be, remember, we have to... So what's the performance impact? Is that good there? Yeah? If you look at some of the... Um, work that comes out of Olympic Games <clears throat> where they, they track 
the most successful athletes, the athletes that will deliver medals. The ones that delivered the medals were those. The ones that had, had the least days lost to training and injury in the previous four years across all sports. And nutrition is the one thing that can fuel you to avoid doing those things. Absolutely, your SNC, your training, your all of those, but this is the bedrock of all of that. This is what fuels, Matt talked about the energy systems, this is what fuels you to be able to do that. And when you don't feel that, then the body has a really good way of protecting itself because it just says, you know what, I'm going to stop this body by being sick or injured, therefore I lose days to training. And it kind of helps protect itself a little bit in there as well. So we've got to try and look at that. Um, we want to get the physical adaptations, okay? Do you think muscle helps you perform? Yeah. Yes, why? More power, more speed, more endurance, okay? Do you think if you're teetering on the brink of what weight you should be, if you lose more weight, where do you think that weight's coming from? It's coming from muscle. So this idea that a number on a scale is, is the be all and end all of everything, we've got to get rid of that idea as well. We, we have got to end this idea that lighter is better. We go back to this, in the long term, it is not. You may get a fast time, but you'll not be able to repeat that in the long term. I'm telling you, I've seen it too many times. It's very frustrating. Okay, so you don't want this, is that right? Yeah. We want this and we want these things. So we gotta, we gotta look to see, is there anything that we can do um, to try and do that? And it is a real, it is tricky, right? So again, we look at all of the, the different um, reasons but for me one of the big reasons is that we're trying to navigate this idea that we have to be X amount of kilos on the scale. Now who would say that there is an ideal there and I suppose I might go to the coaches here that we keep that weight and we try and keep that for as long as we possibly can. Would that be an ideal out there? Is it a thought process that goes there that there's a kind of a, an ideal weight? I'm seeing it. Yeah. I'm seeing it. So there's no ideal that, you know, you might be a racing weight and then you might spend the winter heavier and then you might come down to a weight um, and, and we can go back up again. It's as if when we get to that magic weight, <laughs> oh, this is great. And actually, if we could shave another couple of a half kilo or a third of a kilo off that, I might even be faster again. So we've got to try and, and get out of that um, particular mindset as well. So it is a bit of a maze. There's lots of various different rubbish all over the place as to, but again, it has to be in context. So for example, if we use this one here, um, eating at night makes you fat. Anybody heard that one? Yeah, it's all over the place. Can't eat beyond six o'clock. What happens if you're training at seven from half six to half eight? What do you do then? Right? So, like, I, I did, well, again, frustrates me. Um, I saw an article a couple of years ago now. It was when Brian O'Driscoll was actually um, still playing. So he was given his, his days, how he, how he ate and what he did during his day. Uh, and I, I could just see number one, probably team players or rugby players or Gaelic players saying, oh, that's the way I, I'm going to carry on now. But Brian O'Driscoll trained at probably eight o'clock in the morning and his training was finished by three o'clock in the afternoon. So it was OK that he probably didn't eat anything after six. And God forbid, I'm sure Amy was eating absolutely nothing um, after six anyway. So the point is, there, it has to be set in context. So if you're training from half six to half eight, you not eating at night is an absolute disaster. So why might that be? So um, can somebody give me, one of the coaches maybe even, give me an idea of what a week might look like in terms of training, just to focus in on that particular point.
timings. I'm, I'm really just looking at the timing of when, it, when training sessions might be. What might it look like on a Monday for somebody? Six in the evening? And what, what might that be? Six to half seven, eight? Six to seven? Is that track? Would that be yeah. S and C? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, what does Tuesday look like? Track. What time's that at? Six. Seven. So what time? Six to seven? Yeah. Wednesday? Seven to eight. Track or conditioning? Track. Thursday? Track. What time again in the evening? Yeah. Does somebody have something in the morning? Friday? Rest. 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 <coughs> so that's the day we eat less because we're resting here, is that right? Yeah? Okay, we'll come back to that in a minute as well. Saturday? Long run, what time will that be at? Around 11. 11. <laughs> what? 11. Okay, let's focus, folks. 11 to 1, maybe? 11 to 12.30? And Sunday? Okay, so each day, does anybody do any other sports? Yeah? So we threw that in on top of that as well. Does anybody cycle to anything or walk to training or do stuff? Yeah? So we threw that in on top of that as well. But that's not really training, of course, isn't that right? Yeah, but it still has a cost. So remember, if there's no money in the bank because we're not fueling this well enough, all of those other things add up as well. Now, you see here, we're not really training the same way every day. Do we eat the same way every day? Some people don't. Do some people eat the same way every day? Yes, yeah, so we've got to change that pretty quickly. And again, if somebody's doing something either here on a Friday night, then you need to look at how that quickly you are going into doing that. And remember, look at this. In, less, in 24 hours, we've got two long runs in 24 hours. It's tough enough to recover, well, sorry, 24, 25, 26 hours, depending on when you start at. But it's tough enough to recover properly um, in 24, 25 hours from one long session, and you've got two long sessions there. So you need to have a look at your week, how it can change, have a fa factor in all of those other things, because if you really are running on just about empty, those other things are gonna have a big impact. So that cycling that you might do, that other sport that you might do, uh, those guys that have just gone to university that mommy and daddy is and dropping you off and lifting you and you have to walk maybe three or four miles or kilometers around a university campus that you hadn't thought about before, okay? That costs in terms of energy and that's something then that you don't have in the tank as well. So can you see how some of these things might add up that you may not have factored in and in terms of your ability to fuel as well? So, why are all of these things happening? For me, things like social media is driving this healthy lifestyle, which is great uh, in the main, but the body beautiful is the driving force behind a lot of it. So it's all about how you look as opposed to how you are in the longer term as well. Um, so again, fads and quick fixes, the short term. Everything's about the short term as opposed to what the long term is as well. Um, this perceived idea of what's a winning weight going to be, need to relook at that. Because who's to say that if you gained two kilos of muscle, you couldn't be a faster um, athlete in terms of that as well. Um, a racing weight which is not healthy for the short or long term, so relooking at that. Um, stop focusing on what other athletes look like. Look at yourself and see how you can be the best athlete that you can be. So stop, I don't know how many people I've said, heard say to me, yeah, but when I'm on the start line, um, I'm the biggest athlete that's there. Number one, if that's what's going through your head on the start line, you're beaten before you've even gone anywhere. 
So stop focusing in that and, and start refocusing on your own personal as well. And coaches and others that can have a significant influence. I had a girl with me not that long ago who's six foot two and the coach told her she was chunky. Words like that cannot exist in this dynamic. She was 65 kilos. She was six foot two. Right? Yeah, that's not big. No, not at all. So, the energy equation, why is it, what are we looking at here? So, we're looking for energy balance, okay? That's really important. And it's really, really important through what food goes in versus what comes out. People, they're kind of thinking, right, I've done this amount today, um, I've eaten this amount, that should be about right, okay? In the main, that's generally how it works, but if there's other things that you're not thinking about, or the fact that you've probably eaten a little bit less than you think you've eaten, um, that or done less or done more than you've calculated the, the cost is there. And we also have to take into consideration other costs that there might be as well. So for example, we've got a fuel tank here, okay? Then we've got our training here, and we've got all these other things that are going on below the surface of the skin. So we've got how you're feeling generally, your bone health, uh, immunity, are you at a phase where you're having a growth spurt, um, your blood health, uh, soft tissue, all of these other things that are going on below the level of the skin, okay? So this is your fuel tank here. Which one of these do you think that the fuel tank will give to first, or do you think they're all about the same? Are they all as important as each other, or is one more important than the other? Training's number one. So it's an evolutionary thing. If there's a big lion comes in there, it's irrelevant. If we don't have to, if it eats us, we don't need to worry about that. Okay, so it's about flight or flight. We have to get out of there. So, but what you're hoping is that there's enough fuel to give to each of these systems here. What happens if you think training goes up and that kind of stays the same? So what happens then is the, the fuel that might be going to these particular systems gets redirected back to trying to deal with this. So if we look at that week there where you know you might do something on a Friday evening or you have those two heavy sessions on a Saturday and Sunday and you haven't even thought about really increasing the volume of food that you're eating around that or the fact that on a Friday is a rest day so you're eating nothing, hold on a moment and I'll answer. So you're eating less because you're not doing as much when actually you should be seeing Friday as your active prep day for not only filling the gap that there might have been on a Thursday, but also putting money in the bank for two big days on a Sunday, a Saturday and Sunday, okay? So that's how then a weekend situation can be like that. And if you're doing that week in, week out, that's where the problems start to arise. Calories should be Everybody's very different. So again, it'll depend on your weight, your height. But so, for example, I'll give you an example of a, a 49 kilo, no, sorry, 47 kilogram athlete that I'm seeing at the moment, and and we are aiming to get her to 5,000 calories Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, with her focus being around four and a half thousand calories for the rest of the days because they're her big ticket item days during the week. Now, as her load goes up, we need to push that up to 5,200, 5,300. How do you track that? Um, well, some people use Garmin's or, uh, you know, Fitbits or various bits and pieces to look at what the outputs are on a, a daily basis. But for, for your age group, for your growth, you know, for, for males in here, I would say, Based on that there, we're looking at probably, you know, at least 4,000 calories a day, 4,400, maybe even a bit more for the bigger athletes. And for the females in here, anything probably certainly over 3,000 calories a day, with bigger days needing more. Do people think they're at that at the moment? Yes. Yeah? What does 3,000 calories a day look like? So 3,000 calories a day looks like, um, big bowl of porridge in the morning with two sachets of, of oats um, made with milk with some maybe a couple of eggs with that um, a banana thrown in on top of it 
Um, it could be four Weetabix with half a pint of milk, some berries. It'll be another snack, um, maybe half a bagel toasted, or um, it could be another maybe four or five rice cakes with some peanut butter on it. For lunch, it'll probably be a massive big wrap with maybe two or three slices of cheese, some turkey, ham. Um, it'll be vegetables in that, maybe something like a yogurt with some fruit as well. It might be a milkshake type thing pre you go into train or a yogurt with more fruit. Some nuts in there as well. We've got our dinner coming in. So again, if we just have steak and veg, you know, even with the biggest of steaks, that's only going to be three or four hundred calories. We're nearly looking at a dinner that has to be six or seven or eight hundred calories. Are we eating those volumes? We're not. I know for a fact we're not. Because I'm seeing too many injuries. So, why do we restrict energy? Because again, so what would the first concern be there when I say about that volume of food? It's a lot. Are you going to burn it off? Yeah. Yeah. So the, these are the questions, and I get that. I absolutely get that. But again, for me, um, the volume of food and the reason why we shouldn't be starving ourselves to look at what the problem is. So if we look at our training, do people have this situation where one session's good, one's maybe not so good, one's good? Does it go like that, or? As the week progresses, do people get more and more tired? Does anybody recognize any of those feelings? So one session you're flying, you could train all evening. The next session, dead legged, just really not, you know. Does any of the coaches recognize that in their athletes? Yeah? So this is the reason is because we're probably not feeling this. So we get this kind of scenario here. Where proper fueling actually means that it doesn't result in excess weight gain is we start to see this. The training is much more consistent and actually we improve. We get better, we get faster, we can put in more to our sessions. And it's in this place here, this zone, that we manage our body composition, not through starving ourselves. That's for me where it plays a role. Now, absolutely. I think if we're not eating that volume of food straight away, um, our weight will go up, there will be a bump in it, but it will come back down again um, to the levels that we need as well. So what we get then is more consistent and increased intensities in our training. And you know what? We're not off a week every two months or three or four days because we've got sniffles or, or whatever, or a tight hamstring that we have to take off. So we don't get these days lost, which we then can continue to train, and that gives us our consistency. Do we have athletes that are a bit unlucky because they're getting sicker or injured all the time, coaches? Yeah? So we need to really look at that, because I would hazard a guess that we need to look at the fueling that they're doing as well. So what are the negative effects? Osteopenia, amenorrhea for females. Um, again, athlete said to me yesterday, she went to the doctor um, and obviously because her periods had disappeared and the doctor said, oh yeah, that's normal because you're sporty. It's not normal. Just let's be clear about that. It's not normal. And if it's happening to you, then you need to see about it, okay? If you haven't had a period and you're over 16, then you need to see about that definitely as well. We get a drop in metabolic rate and, and uh, changes in our thyroid function. So these athletes that are saying, oh, I have problems with my thyroid, it's your system actually slowing down because it's not getting fueled enough. So it's actually protecting itself as well. So it's not using as much energy. So you're not as efficient at, at working either. So again, these are all the things that we see. We get injuries, and I'm sure Paul um, has seen plenty of them as well in his day. Um, we get abnormal bloods, so we get low levels of ferritin, hemoglobin dropping, which then puts you at risk of upper respiratory tract infections as well. You're fatigued, you're not able to put in those sessions as good as you might want to. Um, the list goes on. Cardiovascular changes, so changes in um, some of the 
the measures of how healthy our heart is. Um, gastrointestinal symptoms. So again, hand in hand with people with dodgy guts, not feeling great, bloating, all of these types of things, which actually may impact their ability to eat. So I get that as well. We need to sort that particular problem out. Elevation in cholesterol. When I see that coming back with maybe some of the other ones, complete red flag for me. Why do you think that might be the case? Very healthy, train a lot, eat healthy or clean. Why do you think we might see that? Because what happens is cholesterol is a fat. It's stored and released from our liver. And when there's no energy around, the body then starts to kick in and say, right, I need to produce something, get it into the blood to circulate, to provide us with a source of energy in the form of fat. Um, so the blood levels of cholesterol go up. So it's one of the things that if we can get the fuel in right, we'll resolve that within a very short space of time. So that, like, and again, that, that girl that I saw last week or a couple of weeks ago that the coach said she was chunky, her cholesterol was up. So again, as a knock-on effect to the commentary that was made around her, she started to eat less as well. And then we then start to see things like impaired sleep, fatigue, depression, all of these things. Do you think these are useful for long-term involvement in your sport? No. Do you think they're useful for performance? Of course not. And there is no way if we have all of these going on that you're going to see athletes from this room continuing on at a, a, a consistent level down the line, which is what we're looking for really. So this is why all of these things kind of we get lots of different things going on in different areas. I saw a male a couple of weeks ago uh, as well. I had more testosterone than he did because he decided, and, and the interesting thing was that he came in, went to the doctor, <coughs> bloods under performance, couldn't sustain sessions, um, basically was absolutely banned axed really. Went in, got his bloods done, his testosterone, I think, was seven. Um, you know, 19's low. Um, so his was seven. And basically, he had dropped five kilos, but he said he wanted to clean up his diet even more. So um, alarm bells going off all over the place. So again, hadn't been fueling any of this, had dropped his intake of food, had a direct impact, not only on his health, but on his performance as well. So when we get levels of testosterone dropping like that, that will affect males' bone health as well. It'll affect their overall ability to, um, to perform too. So this energy, this balance that we need, we need to really try and, and look at what we have. So how do we try and calculate that? So let's say we've got somebody who um, is eating 1800 calories a day okay but they're doing two training sessions and those two training sessions add up to 1200 calories which is easy enough way to do it two hard sessions you know some of those long runs will certainly be close on maybe 900 calories a thousand calories for some people as well so the individual is 60 kilos and they have a, a body fat of 20 percent and some people might say that's actually quite high for somebody who's not eating an awful lot and training an awful lot or training a lot. I actually see that quite a bit because again, it's the body protecting itself a little bit and your inability to drop body fat, you lose muscle, but you can't drop body fat as well, which isn't really performance enhancing. So this individual has a body fat of 20%. That means that they actually have 48 kilos of lean mass. So this is the key thing that we're looking for here. So what we do here is 1800 is what they're taking, 1200 is what they're using up. So that leaves 400 calories left for all those things that we talked about. General health, bone health, immunity, bloods, blah, -de blah, -de blah. You see what I mean? So that means that there's only 12 and a half calories per kilogram of, of lean mass available. Now, they're saying that less than 20 calories per kilogram of lean mass is definitely a no-go zone. We see that 
all the time. So this is what happens. This is what we're aiming for. So the athlete that I saw during the week, she came in to me uh, probably almost a year ago now and she was around about less than 20 calories per kilogram of lean mass. So based on us trying to get her up now to between four and a half and five thousand calories, we have her on about 48 calories per kilogram of lean mass. Okay, I'm going to give you some commentary from her at the end just because I can talk to you till the cows come home. I, I think it's your fellow athletes that will actually hopefully make you sit up and listen to you know the, the negatives or the learning. I think take some of this, the older athletes and, and take what they've learnt and maybe avoid the pitfalls that they've gone through as well. So we get definitely problems when we're in this, you know, um, but we may have to go to this point for a short period of time when you get to a race where, okay, we, we may need to look at dropping a little bit of weight. We may need to get, but we can't stay there all of the time. And then we certainly have problems um, if we've got anything below that. People say, but sure, I've been doing this for ages and I'm, I was grand, how come this has happened now? Because you kind of used up all your reserves, your resilience, it's all gone. So what happens is we have changes in um, training volume that can happen. Um, you know, you just think about nutrition as an afterthought, it's not really planned. So do we always do the same thing all the time or can sometimes other things take over from us eating and drinking after training or before training? Can we get caught up in other things sometimes? Yeah, we can't. We have to really keep it simple, do the same things all the time and just keep doing it as well. Um, timing of training, conflicting with eating opportunities as well. So again, what I would suggest in these situations here where you have your main training sessions in the evening time, I would try and push my biggest meal of the day earlier in the day. So you take the pressure off yourself having to eat a big meal either before or after you train and then that's actually of use to you and then you focus on two good sized snacks around that evening session as well. Um, and then we've got some people then that definitely do have um, some behaviours around food that maybe might not be um, as healthful as it potentially could be. So we looked at a review um, uh, 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 one of our PhD students, Danielle, um, and basically there's a lot of problems in terms of, of energy availability. Um, and then we've, we've gone to, to look at this even more. Um, I want to, these guys here, do you think they know what they're talking about? Do you think any of them could run around a track and do 1500 meters, 5k, 10k? Could they do that? Yeah, absolutely. But this is a gain. That's not going to get them any kind of anything at all. So we've got to stop listening to these shower um, as being the gurus of whatever. Okay, they've got abs, that's great. But, you know, their bones might be an absolute shit for want of a better technical term. <laughs> and they probably will be actually down the line. Um, down the, so red flags for me. Weight loss or resistance to weight gain. Uh, weight which is lower than necessary for best performance. Uh, poor body image, uh, preoccupation or focus with body shape. Um, so again, body check-in, uh, inspection, critical self-evaluation. These are all the things coaches look out for. Um, be mindful that they could just be um, uh, excessive training. So over and above beyond what is. So again, athletes coming back from injury, not listening to what they've been told, um, finding out that they're actually doing other things, maybe swimming on a bike. I've had ones on bikes with boots, cycling here, there and everywhere, but that's not training. Um, so exceeding the coach's recommendations. Some of these are, are obviously much more of the, the, the classical ones, but again, these are much more about what you'll see now. Uh, oh no, I don't eat dairy, I, do, I don't eat gluten, um, I'm lactose intolerant, um, I, I can't have wheat. Um, you know, for me, lots of these are, are actually fantastic umbrellas to cover an eating disorder because it allows you to restrict your food intake 
in a way that's actually normalized now so it's easy and then we've got things like you know athletes coming and feeling sick or dizzy or fainting at training anything ever that happen coaches but shaky not feeling up to it nauseous those types of things so again if that's happening then that would be acute signs that you're, you're not fueled well enough as well so uh sorry why yeah why do we get the elevation of cholesterol um so again we we all always see we can see this from the disordered eating literature where people with anorexia would actually um, present with high levels of cholesterol and it, it is one of the reasons then that heart disease is more prevalent than in people with eating disorders as well so we've got to take that as a, a very important um, factor that we need to get sorted as well we also see changes in in neutrophil counts as well and these changes mirrors our um, changes with our cholesterol as well so I would be looking at things like neutrophils again a good indication that people aren't recovering properly um, carbohydrate is the main fuel for our white blood cells so if there's not enough carbohydrates going in directly after a session in the longer term it's going to affect that as well which puts us at risk so this is a, a, a lady that I saw last summer I want to give you a couple of case studies just to show that I'm not I'm not making this up right um, she was 26, middle distance runner. Um, she presented to me in clinic last April and she reported that she was having a lot of diarrhea. That was the main problem that was starting to have. She was actually, um, you know, struggling with that and being able to sustain any training. Um, again, she had been working, this had been going on for a, a period of time back. Um, she had been training with the aim of being selected for an international competition the previous September, but again presented with another injury. So that ruled that out yet again. She was disappointed with that. She had a shift type pattern of work. Um, so then that ruled her out of that cross country season. The injury was now better and she was back training for a 10K in June, but this training was being interrupted by this um, here. And this is things that we would see regularly as well. She had a history as a child of lactose intolerance and that seemed to have appeared again. She'd gone <coughs> off um, somewhere and, and, and whether that was linked to it or not, we weren't 100% sure. Her menstrual cycle had always been irregular, um, but it, it had definitely been less prevalent in the recent year. And again, her weight had dropped from 54 kilos to 49 kilos kilos and she was actually concerned about this because she felt that it wasn't she hadn't actually actively tried to do that herself so again this is this is her kind of training um, weeks so you can see gym and run at half six in the morning walk to work run tempo run do you see all this pretty heavy schedule isn't it yeah, yeah? okay usually didn't have breakfast until after we got to work um, maybe had a bar, protein bar, something like that. Again, food intake around the running was tricky because she was afraid she was going to have the runs. So we were starting to get all sorts of, of problems there. So what happened was I said to her she wanted to compete in the 10K in June. Um, I, f I felt really because there were so many issues going on that she needed to really, really consider taking a little bit of time out of her running, which she actually agreed herself um, that. So after that 10K, she stepped away from training for a while. Um, this allowed us to actually get her weight up by the end of June to by four kilos. When I saw her the following September, her weight in total had gone up by six and a half kilos. She had a light menstrual period then in the July, which was about 10 weeks post our initial. So she responded very quickly to her weight going up and to reduction in volume of training. So the two of them hand in hand helped that much quicker possibly than it would have been if she continued to do a little bit of running. Okay. She, re she had then had a second one and she felt then uh, she contacted me and I said I felt that she could restart her training. And guess what? She ran a PB. Is more and more and more and more better sometimes? She actually ran a PB. She's flying. Okay. She changed obviously her work pattern. She re-looked at everything a little bit because it just wasn't working. Okay. We had to look at a pattern of her eating around training. She was eating these protein bars. 
Um, anybody ever heard of fulfill bars? Yeah. yeah, lethal for your guts, right? So as endurance athletes, really, it shouldn't be the way forward. Why do you think they're so popular? Because people on Instagram have them. People on Instagram have them, brilliant. That's about right. Um, but because they can say they're sugar free, and at the moment, sugar is evil. But guess what people do when they take out sugar out of things? They put other things in there. And one of the things that they add in is a product called sorbitol or xylitol or mannitol, which are actually sugar alcohols. And what they can cause is they can cause the runs. So she was using this as a fueling strategy. Um, she had some IBS. So these would be one of the ones that we would try and avoid. So that's why I say food is context. For me, there's no such thing as a bad or a good food. This is, that's perceived as healthy. Don't touch it. It's a waste of time. You might as well be eating a chocolate bar personally, I think. So now what we were in the situation was that her training load now is going back up again. So she can't stay where she thinks she's done really well and increased her food intake quite a bit, but she has got to increase it again because her training load has gone up as well. And actually this for her is great because she responded to her feeling really well with her menstrual function returning to normal. So she can actually use this as a monitor for her self to say, right, I'm actually fueling well enough. Or if that starts to deteriorate again, um, there's something wrong. Okay. So from a female point of view, um, quite lucky there from a male point of view, we don't have um, something probably that we can use to monitor, which is um, a bit unlucky there. This lady here, again, um, initially periods, long number of years without anything. And when we now see what we do is we look at her being a five week cycle, but when it goes, her weight drops down, it goes out further. And we know that that's not the place where we need to be either. And we need to look at that. So you can see here a couple of energy availability cases where I've worked out for this one here, it was a combat sport. Um, she got a lot of injuries, but again, I would classify her to be in the disordered eating category because she was very focused in keeping carbohydrates relatively low. Um, and this caused quite a lot of problems with her um, managing her ability to intake fuel as well. This lady here, female distance runner, um, again, it's interesting because she's the one that I would say possibly had a higher body fat than she might think she should have had. But part of the problem was she had what I would call um, a, a, a relationship with food where she, someday she would eat absolutely loads. She would have what you would probably call a binge and then she would feel guilty and then eat nothing. Okay. But what was happening was she wasn't doing it around this training profile. So on the days where she was actually training quite hard, she was eating very little. And then that was causing the problems in the longer term. But again, um, lots of uh, injuries and really, you know, with probably two or three stress fractures of her foot. Another one again, so quite a low body fat, um, energy availability quite low at certain times. Compliance, good, but she needed ongoing prompting there as well. I'm nearly finished. I don't want any sleepers here. So do you follow guidance? Do you think are you all good? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Kind of. And then some people know. So we've got the good, the bad and the ugly in here in terms of following guidance. Why would, and I get it why you wouldn't. Basically, the volume of food is huge, folks. If you think you're eating enough, I'm telling you, you could nearly put a half time as much on top of that and that probably would just be about right. So it is quite a lot. Like I've, I've tried to show athletes, I've put what 6,000 calories looks like out, you know, and, and I go, I know you're not eating that because you couldn't run with that volume of food inside you. So, uh, and you know, we've done some of these tests where, you know, the mucin test for underperformance, where you actually have to give somebody um, a, a quantity of food. And what we did was it was we used porridge actually the first time and the athlete was taking it. It took her an hour to eat the bowl of porridge we had in front of her. So I knew from that she wasn't doing what she told me she was doing because there's no way you'd be sitting for an hour to eat the volume of food. So again, some wee hints and tips like that as well. The fear of the food. 
And I think that's the biggest problem. There is a fear because it's being driven by lots of different things. But if we can train harder, move faster, we will um, be able to um, manage that. A fear of weight gain. Um, and again, then what we do is we follow guidance for a while and then we revert to old behaviors or we think, oh, we've made that improvement. I, and I can just stay there now. Where in fact, I'm hoping that your training load will go up and up and up. And we need to continue to put that up and up and up as well. So what we did was we screened for risk of low energy availability in Ireland in recreationally active females. Um, we've done the same for males. Um, and, and we're actually just in the process of, of looking at that data now. Um, but basically what we're seeing is that about 40%, 40%, it's quite high, our risk for energy availability. So what we did was we, we used a questionnaire, a LEAF questionnaire, which is out there in the literature, you can do that. Um, you know, things like menstrual function. Uh, if you've got, does your menstruation change when your exercise increases? Yes. How many injuries or days have you been absent due to injuries? Um, have you issues with your gut? Um, so what we found is that across a range of different sports, 40% of you guys have a risk of having energy availability issues. So that is something that we need to look at. So the, the higher, the more competitive you are in sport, the bigger the risk, okay? You factor in another sport on top of that, you're at even bigger risk as well. So um, it does happen out there. And these are the things of outcomes, 22 days lost to injury, that's three weeks of your year. It's quite a lot, isn't it? Again, about 23 weeks lost to um, sickness, um, menstruation stops, cramping, bloating, things that might be um, affecting your performance as well. Um, stress fractures, 12% reported. So those that were at risk, 12% of them had stress fractures. That's not really hectic for a runner, is it? No. And a couple of stress fractures and you're really into really dicey ground then in terms of that too. So what are the dietary patterns which I thought was interesting? About 47% followed a low carbohydrate um, diet. Some of them were gluten free, um, so dairy free and paleo or high protein, whatever. So again, once we start looking at some of these specific dietary patterns would be a red flag in terms of... So it's all well and good if you want to follow some of these. But the point is, the question you ask yourself is, why are you doing it? And if you need to do it, then you need to put in alternative foods to make up the difference, right? So you can't just remove stuff and think, I'm sure it'll be grand. You've got to put in alternatives um, to do that. So this is an interesting one. Dairy-free, 21%. Calcium is our key nutrient along with protein and vitamin D for our bone health, okay? So if we take out, where else do you think we might get calcium from if we take out dairy produce or milk? Anybody, any idea what our second most important source of calcium is in the diet? Bananas? No. Nope. Fruits. Isn't it? Like <laughs> almond drinks and like all that. Bread. <laughs> Flour. So flour is fortified with calcium. So look what happens if you decide that you're going to be gluten-free and dairy-free as well. You're really in trouble when it comes to your bone health. So what really do think, and this idea that we can get, you know, the same nutrients from other milks, be that almond, rice, um, what's another, there's oat there. Listen, they are effectively colored water. It's useful for hydration but you're getting nothing in it. The only alternative probably to dairy would be soya, where a lot of them are fortified and there's a, a higher amount of protein um, in that as well. The rest of them, waste of time, okay? Yeah, you can use them, but don't expect that you'll get anything of any benefit really, apart from maybe an alternative fluid source there as well. And this is really what we're trying to avoid, right? So look how thick the cross links are here in this normal bone. And look where we're going to in a bone with osteoporosis. Think of your crunchy bar, the middle of it, 
that's what we want if you've sucked away the middle of it then that's what you're going to get that is your bone at the end of um, this we can't recover from this folks there's no going back from that if we have osteopenia which is a step back we can actually we can diversify and bring it back now one of the thoughts is that when you sweat you actually lose calcium out of your um, system as well so one of the protecting mechanisms that you might do is that around your sessions where you're training a lot if you put a, a drink or a, a recovery that has calcium in it you can actually negate the loss so you're actually cost neutral for that session in terms of calcium so that's why looking at maybe um, milkshakes or yogurt based smoothies or stuff like that as a, 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 a strategy around your heavy sessions might be very very useful so before we have any sleepers um, there's about 40 percent if you have low energy availability risk um, there is higher risk from our females competing competitively and definitely you are going to lose more days to training um, and be less consistent as well so oh, i'm going to move on because i know i'm running out of time here so i just want to finish with this particular athlete have a little read at just some of her commentary around what she's learned the lessons learned here um, you can do all the training in the world, but if your diet isn't matching your training load, you've already lost. I've experienced what it is to be too light, um, 45 kilos, and I think pure shite is a technical term for what that feels like. But anyway, um, there's nothing nice about crawling across the finishing line or being beaten, and it's purely down to you and your underfueling. It does sometimes take a scare to make you realize that you need to change. And I think it's important that you, yourself athletes, are the ones that want to change, not your coaches, not your parents. Uh, if you care enough, you'll do anything that you can to be fueling as part of that. So in the lead up to National Cross Country Championships last year, um, she gained a kilo and she was also heavier in weight. And she's, so we don't have to be afraid of weight as an issue for speed because she probably gained muscle mass here. So being too light, um, you know, that's not good. So just to finish off, portion sizes for food that are plastered all over social media are completely irrelevant to me as an athlete, and I need to more than fuel my training. When you're training hard, it's okay sometimes to eat unhealthy foods. And again, don't label foods as good or bad. It's not the way forward. Rocket leaves and chickpeas do not count. These will not give you the calories. I've learned not to listen to the crap I see on social media. Often the people that you see posting are actually in unhealthy relationship with food themselves. So don't be looking at them, don't look up to them and think, oh, this is the way to go because they actually have issues too. So weekends is great for prep. You know, use your time effectively. How can all the Africans eat barely anything else? Um, again, they're not us. <coughs> they have different genetics. They have different ways in terms of training. But if you look at their actual eating, most of it's based around grains. So their carbohydrate intakes are actually quite good. So, um, but again, I wouldn't look at the Africans and say, right, I'll have to base myself around that. I focus on me, but they do eat quite a lot of carbohydrate, Is much more. So fast they eat so many carbs? Well, I think it's possibly part of it. Uh, living at altitude. So, uh, what makes you think that Africans don't eat much food? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I still can't control you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a lot of the Kenyans would eat food, regardless of their main source of carbohydrate, which is really energy dense food. And, and the thing about it is. Just on that, Matt, anybody who's been to a World Championships and been in the Champagne area watching African athletes eat? It's massive. They eat plenty. Yeah. And, but and, there's athletes to shame. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, but this is the point we are saying, I think we, we've just highlighted what the perception is, is that because they're so skinny, people assume that they're not eating. And that's not the case. And I'm saying to you that if you do eat, I have athletes that we have reduced their body composition from 20% to 12% when we've doubled their calorie intake to 6,000. 
Okay, so there should be no fear in that. It takes a little bit of time. But this perception that to be skinny means you can't eat, we've got to get rid of that. This has got to go. That's not the case. So food is really fuel and diet is equally as important as my training. So don't have it as the enemy. We can't have it as the enemy. I'm going to finish up now before you all do fall asleep. Um, you know, weight isn't the enemy. Scales do not measure muscle mass. And if you're not fueled and if you've no muscle, then you're not going to be able to do um, the work that we would, you would like to be able to do, your coaches would like you to be able to do. Listen to your body cues, right? For females, it's easier potentially, but there are other, you know, cues. You're feeling tired. You're going up and down in your training. You're getting sick. You're picking up niggly injuries. These are cues. You need to listen to them as well. You're just not unlucky. So really relook at what you are doing and see how that um, goes. And success really isn't about what you can see on the top. We need to look about what's going on um, down the center of you as a, an individual and your body, which is effectively what's going to um, make you a better athlete as well. Just for some of the females that are in here as well, we are doing a survey because I do know that um, PMS is a problem and can be an issue and, and also a reason why people may go on the oral contraceptive pill, which is another problem as well. So, you know, if any of you have time to fill out that survey, um, we have it sent out from um, some of our Instagram accounts, um, Sport Ireland have sent it out as well. Matt, we can probably get it sent out through AI, potentially. Why, why, why is it no problem with that? Because basically the pill induces menopause, right? Okay. So, at 18, 16, 17, 18, the pill basically controls your estrogen and progesterone and cuts it out, which is effectively menopause. So that's a problem because these are the most important uh, hormones for your bone development. And if we are getting rid of those at a very early age, you're effectively you know, hiding to nothing in terms of your bone health down the line. So it should not be the first port of call um, to look at to manage um, menstrual function. The other thing is if we're saying that menstrual function can be used as a a kind of a monitor for you and your system. If we're on the pill, we don't have that because you don't, you don't have a period on the pill. You have a withdrawal bleed. So it, it doesn't exist, it's gone. So don't think that you do and you're grand. You don't. So it should not be the first port of call in terms of managing any of the symptoms that you do have around that. And I get that that is a problem and it is a significant problem um, for some of our, our female athletes. But there are ways that we can potentially look to, to manage that as well that doesn't go down that route. It should be the last, it should be the last, you know, it should be the first port of call really. So we might get that sent out as well just to see um, there. So again, hopefully no sleepers. Um, any questions? Uh, what was it? 1,000 calories, right, what does 1,000 calories look like? Um, we could have, let's say, three, six, 300 grams of chicken, or which would be a really big chicken breast. Um, it would be maybe ha half of your plate um, covered in veg. It would have to be probably about four potatoes, fist-sized potatoes, um, with some gravy. That's what I'm saying, so if we, if we look at that, how can you, can you run after that? Uh, the, next morning. the next morning, yeah, but not direct, yeah. So again, we've got to look at maybe ways where we can bring a thousand calories in, which is less of a volume. So that's why liquids can actually play a really useful role. So for example, if you get a blender, throw in some frozen berries, maybe 200 grams of full fat Greek yogurt, some milk, we could use, you know, the powdered linseeds and nuts and stuff, because again, um, we need to add in some fats because that will keep the volume down, but push the calories up a little bit. Things like peanut butter or nut butter thrown in there as well, that can really drive up the amount of calories. And it's easier sometimes to drink that volume of calories than it, and then be able to do something afterwards than it is to, to eat it in terms of solid foods. 
after like the session or run what would be like an ideal food? Well something like that would be useful because you could take a little bit of that and then come home and have some of your dinner then as well. So again um, the dairy is useful or, or that shake type scenario because it will give you your protein and carbohydrates to help recover the muscle and also if we're thinking about calcium as being important we're getting that in there or take a little bit of it through your session as well if you're going to be there for a long period of time or if you're doing a conditioning session or more of not a condition session but more of a strength session where it's weights then you should be able to have something during that session start to teach yourself how to take on board fuel um, because one of the things that has been shown particularly for males it's the length of time you go between eating that's important too because then we go into deficits so we might be getting enough in over the course of the week but there's significant deficits in the week where effectively you're burning um, you know your own systems which you don't want uh, for recovery reasons, like would you would you recommend uh, magnesium or anything like that for the muscles? Like um, if you're not doing this right, that's like putting sprinkles on top of a cake that's not there. Do you see what I mean? So we got to focus on what the basics are first. And the other thing is, if we eat more food, we get more of everything else. Okay, if we get the calories in, the energy, that's your number one priority. So it's like saying to somebody. Um, right, you're going you're gonna to use up, um, that, that's where this whole idea is that if we're eating rocket and tomatoes and it's all really good for us, it is great, but it's not giving us the energy that we've used up. So the fatigue from the lack of carbohydrate is going to have more of an effect on your muscle than any amount of magnesium that you're going to fire in on top of that. Okay. My goodness, this is the front row interest. <laughs> yes, we're listening. Can you still be under fueling if you're maintaining your weight? Yes very much so. That weight shouldn't be an indicator because the body will s try to protect itself. So weight actually, that, that, that's a really good question. A lot of athletes will say, but I, I'm grand because my weight's really stable. Um, so no, weight shouldn't be used as a, an indicator of, of energy availability. Yeah. Can I ask you about the, um, the fueling uh, that you talked about? Uh, you talked about the good fueling. What, what's your view on the kind of the factory with 30 burger and Freddy and pizza and Well, again, uh, um, I suppose it's all in context as well. Um, and I suppose what, what I'm trying to get away from is this labeling of foods as dirty or clean or whatever. If 90 or 80% of the time you're doing what you perceive is the right thing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And in fact, if anything, if you've come from a training session and you're going to a really long run on a Saturday, it might not be the worst. For me, what's the context of why it would be dirty or bad? It's all about that. For me, who's not going to do two hours on a Saturday morning running and won't certainly be doing it, absolutely, it's probably not the best thing to be doing on a Friday night. But for those that are going to go out and do two hours of a long session at steady or hard state, you know, I, I think it's all about context. Plus, it's also enjoyable. So we have to think about, you know, there's maybe a social reaction there or interaction with food, friends, blah, blah, blah. That's OK. I would actually sometimes prefer that than a plate of rocket. <laughs> I really have it in against rocket. I think it's just on Instagram all the time. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Were you going to ask something, Paul? So if we take it, is there one thing that we might do different? Take it away? Yeah? yeah? Well, that's always a good sign, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the if I get maybe within an hour before I run that like, exam, I would get a red spot <laughs> in my vision for half an hour before it disappears. Yeah. So is there a time where it maybe well I think it's very that's a very individual thing and I think everybody will have their own individual where they don't like to eat too much beforehand so I suppose Saturday morning is a good example there what do you do if you're out quite early on a Saturday morning for a long run and you don't feel you want to eat 
Therefore, Friday night does become the priority for what you do eat. Plus then sometimes the liquids is easier than the solids are. So yeah, the volume of food and the type of foods can, can sometimes be a problem um, very soon. They would say it takes about two hours to probably digest a big feed, bigger meal. So that's why I'm saying if on the nights where you're doing your training in the evening, trying to push your main meal of the day earlier in the day is sometimes a, a better way that that fuel then is broken down and available for you to do that session. I, I'm not sure what the red dot is. Um, <laughs> that, that's a new one. Yeah, you're feeling sluggish. Yeah. Well, it is. So you push a lot of food in very close. Basically, what happens is the oxygen runs to digest that to try and take. So it's going away from the muscles. So you're not getting it. There is competition there. Absolutely. So you're obviously so for you, you know, eating hours beforehand is probably better um, or the night beforehand if that happens to be. But again, topping that up with something maybe in a liquid format is maybe the way forward rather than solids. Um, I think again, if we're doing it relative to uh, what we're training, there shouldn't be. Okay, if your weight goes up 10 kilos in a week or two weeks, then there's maybe alarm bells there, but I can't see it to be brutally honest. I don't think so. Um, yeah, just any suggestions on how young athletes can like empower themselves to not compare? Like social media is so big. That's a, a really good question. It's it's very tricky because it it's all over the place. Everybody, you know, so therefore I think really focusing in on what your aims and objectives are. What what are you trying to achieve? Remembering that that's very different from those ones up there, you know, they're trying to sell a book or whatever So what are you trying to do? You're trying to be a healthy athlete that's not going to get injured That has longevity as an athlete that maybe has other things that you have to do college or whatever So it's always bringing it back to what you you are and yes 100% you will get influenced by some of the other things but you know there's enough evidence out there to know those guys aren't posting the bad days it's only the good stories isn't it it's never the other stuff that's going on out there and you know what they have it going on in spades as well but you're not going to find out about that they'll only want to sell you the positive stories there so we will get sucked into it but we have to come back thinking do you know what I'm going to focus on me and you know that will be the responsibility of you and your coaches um, to, to keep that relatively tight and, and to always have you know what am I aiming to try and do here um, am I getting better because I've decided that I'm going to go down this route have a think about what that athlete said there these are the things that you've got to, to I think focus on what do you think Matt yeah definitely